we need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. And I'm Thomas O'Neill White. After May 14th, how can we afford not to talk about race? About education, about segregation, about humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Topps market. The suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. If we're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truths. On today's Buffalo What's Next, we'll hear from some new and younger voices. Our guests were part of the 4-H Youth After School Program through the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Erie County. We met at the offices of Say Yes on Jefferson Avenue in Buffalo. My name is Jaden Phillips. I am 15 and I am a student at Kinesis High School. Hi everyone, my name is Giselle Manuel. I am 17 and I'm a senior at Divinity High School. Jamie and Uti, 23 years young, Youth Sport Management Program Manager. I'm Sherman Webb Middlebrooks. I'm 31 and I'm a lifelong Buffalo resident, full-time black man. My name is Sarah Jablonski. I'm a 4-H educator with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Erie County. While the guests may be new to the program, they were asked some familiar questions. The first, what do you like about Buffalo? Many of the answers were edited for time. And as for Jaden, he expressed a spirit shared by many 15-year-olds, whether it's from today or 45 years ago. You could say there's new opportunities, but like in other states and other cities soon, like there's more out there, uh, better opportunities, better living conditions. This is so funny because <laughs> I feel like I'm always talking with Jaden about the, the benefits and the qualities of Buffalo because I feel like the young brother sitting across from me is only, is only 15 years young to use Jamie's term and maybe he hasn't had the chance uh, to experience all the great things that this city has to offer. And I also don't feel like he has enough of an appreciation for the historical significance of this place that we call home. Um, so I would just say the for me personally, there is a tremendous amount of, like I just said, historical significance um, with this area, whether it's the, the city with lights, uh, being the final stop on the Underground Railroad, the Erie Canal, the grain elevators, all the, the architecture, the, the parks, all of those special things from yesteryear, but also going forward. I think the greatest part of living in this city not only um, is its past, but also the potential uh, of this place. It's almost like a blank canvas. So, For multiple reasons, uh, I love the, the place I call home, but I'll just leave it there. Buffalo is the rough buff. We don't get our name for no reason. I'm kind of a little iffy on the city of good neighbors, but I'm with that too. It's a lot of room for me to grow within my city, but then also a lot of room for the city to grow within the city. Um, and yeah, that's why I love Buffalo. It's small, um, mm -hmm. tight knit. Like it's just, yeah, it's just that's that's my style of, of living. And like I said, it's biased because I was born and raised here. I can definitely tell where Jade is coming from because as I was like, I'm not gonna say as I was growing up because I'm only still 17, but as I came to a realization early in age that I don't really like how it is here. Like maybe it's like something has to change. That change is just gonna happen. I have to either make that change myself or find people that's gonna help me do it. I love my city, but at the same time, I'm trying to decide whether I should let it go or stay here. Our panel was also asked about May 14th, the day of the racist attack on the tops, located just a few blocks from where our conversation was occurring. Hmm, it's kind of tough for me to share, but when I found out I was at home and uh, my mom came home and she was like having like a little, she was a little shook up and I was like, as being the oldest child, I, you know, actually was wrong, he took care of her. And that's when I started seeing my friends were texting me to see if everyone was okay because I had friends who lived over there so we were all texting to see if everyone was okay. And that's when I found out what happened. And only another reason why I really found out what happened because we were all texting my uncle, my like my cousins and them that lived over there. And that was the same day I found out my uncle had passed away in the hospital for a disease, like an illness he had. So it was really heartbreaking for me because it was like 
I was scared and concerned for my friends that live over there, but also I lost a loved one to a disease in a hospital. So it was really heartbreaking for me and it really shook up my family because my mom was already one to over worry. Like she loves her kids, but she doesn't want them to grow up in an environment where they have to feel scared all the time. So for me to see my mom, like every store she went into, she was like insecure. The only first thing she looked for was every single exit inside the store. Whether she would look for any exit, anywhere she can get out, anywhere she can hide, anywhere. And that's saying something as like, it is like my mom, it's like my role model. So it's like seeing her act like this really shook me up and it kind of really scared me and it hurt me to see how my mom had to react and act like this. I'm not gonna lie, I was kind of scared like going to like different stores after that because there was a bunch of rumors too. Like days after about how there's like, friends or so doing that in other stores and then there's a McDonald's incident where somebody brung a gun and then police retained it so that was pretty much it for the most part on May 14th I was very pregnant I had a baby on June 16th and I think I was actually really tired so I was napping it was a very warm beautiful day I remember hearing children playing outside when I woke up, and then I checked my phone, my friend from California had texted, is everybody okay in Buffalo? So then I looked at the news and saw the information about what was happening. And then I started, I actually texted Sherman. That was one person who I knew works at the, was working near, very nearby, and because he does programs on the weekends. That was, um, I live on the west side, but it's really only like a mile and a half from my house. Um, so, I, I'm not sure that, I think I texted a few other young people that day. There's a number of graduates from our program who I still talk to. Um, <clears throat> and, yeah, fortunately everybody I reached out to was okay, but it was, it was surreal, especially since the kids continued to play outside. And I looked outside and I was like, what's going on? And then I, I mean, I was pregnant, so I, um was very shaken by it. It was a difficult time to be happy about being about to have a baby. Mm -hmm. I was I was really worried and, and really, just really deeply saddened. Sherman Webb Middlebrooks also recalls nice weather on May 14th. After working much of the early day, he and a friend spent the afternoon down at the waterfront, trying to stay away from their busy phones. When he heard what had happened, his mind began taking a quick turn. That's the same tops that like my mom goes to because she lives in this neighborhood. And when my grandma was alive, I should take her and my grandma to that tops. And my, my grandfather, who lives upstairs from my mom, he goes to that tops. And he was just there the day before. And so like that was kind of spooky for me, just thinking about how close it could have been with him being like a 80-year-old black man. Like he would have definitely been a target. Like many, the reality of May 14th began to seep in as details became available. Then the next day, I started realizing like the effect and the impact it had on everybody in the community, and I finally let it sit with me. And then I couldn't leave my house until the 18th because I just had like this level of anger. Like where I come from, like I don't, I love Dr. King, but I'm more Malcolm. You're not, I'm not turning the other cheek. I'm gonna get my lick back one way or another. You're not getting over on me. I'm getting, I'm going even the score. I'm going to get my lick back. And I wanted my lick back. And that meant they posted his mama address. I wanted to go see his mama. I wanted to make his family, his community, feel the same way they made my family and my community feel. But then I looked at my little daughter and I realized I would be crashing out and taking myself away from her to go get my get back. And I just couldn't leave the house for three days because if I got in my car, I was driving to Broome County. And so I, I saw what folks in the community were doing. And then some folks who I love held a community healing circle. And I just decided like, I right, this is gonna be the time where I step out. So that was like my experience with that. But I had to process it myself, understand those emotions, think it through, and then show up for other people in the community because I'm expected to be there and hold space for others. And I couldn't. And I was just glad that folks were strong enough at that time to hold space for people like me who wanted to crash out and do something dumb. Just vividly just remember pacing back and forth from the porch inside the house, just like, yo, this is crazy. 
and everything then felt like it was moving in slow motion. Like just that that day for from when I found out was was mad long, and it was just like yeah, and kind of what Sherman said like, excuse me, it took me some time to be able to get to a space where he was at, because it was like yeah, I, I don't really know. It wasn't that I was acting out of fear. It was like nah, I'm, somebody gonna get hurt. Like so I'm, I'm better off like not not doing anything and just staying in the house for that weekend. But uh, I'm gonna give a shout out to uh, Dan Robertson and Tommy McClam because mm -hmm. they had uh, hosted a like a like basically like a, just a. a, a um, a conversation. If if you need it, come talk. And like, yeah, we just chopped it up. And I needed that because then that powered me um, to get through the week. And I wasn't really trying to speak to nobody. I was trying to stay to myself. But it was a matter, like Sherman said, just taking the time away. Just yeah, things still have to happen. So that was a nice space for them to, to be able to provide to speak on. But then also like sit in my own like um, thoughts and feelings to be able to cope and understand that like. Like like your uh, man said, Sherman. Um, I'm not gonna let no one put fear in my heart. Like I'm 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 stepping out the house. Or I'm doing what I gotta do. And like ever since then, I, you know, I um I didn't took that approach and I still do. So yeah. This segment of Buffalo What's Next features conversations with members of the 4-H Youth Weekly After School Program, and a special thanks also to the Erie County Youth Bureau and the Erie County Restorative Justice Coalition. We also asked about the response on Buffalo's east side in the days, weeks, and months after May 14th. As someone who lives on the east side, I saw a lot of the people there were actually just calling family from, like, making sure everyone was okay. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of people actually going out of their way to go down there to make sure people were okay, make sure people had that support. They were having, like, relief circles anywhere. Like, a lot of the uh, places they had down there were helping people. The idea of City of Good Neighbors actually came into play because people were like, like I said before, they were having, they were giving out relief stuff, they were giving out anything, anybody needed, anybody support, they were helping, they were help any much help they needed, everyone was helping each other. So being proudly from the East Side, I'm very proud of my Black African American East Side Buffalo. It really speaks to the fact that Black people in general in America are at times to our own detriment, some of the most forgiven, accepting people who ever walked the face of the earth. Like one of the, the biggest fears that was present in the minds of folks during um, slavery was, oh, if you, give them, if you let them be free, they're gonna come back and kill us all for revenge. And yet we have never done that, despite the hundreds of years of wrongful dehumanizing treatment that we received, we've never gotten our lick back. Um, and so that just showed again that a lot of people felt the way that I felt, but were able to take the time to process through those natural human emotions. I don't know if not doing anything was the answer. Like, like, like you said, Sherman, not to keep bringing you up, but like, it's just helping me think a bit more clear in terms of being real within myself, but then also the situation of like, when is this going to stop? Harsh things are done. We respond to doing nothing about it, and then it's just a, oh, yeah, that was so tough. And it's just like, like on some real, I'm tired of having conversations like that. And so it's like, I, I respect all the resiliency in terms of Buffalo not doing anything, but it's, it's a, I ain't saying, I ain't promoting violence now, but I'm just saying, like, if somebody was to come up to Tops and, and handle their business, whatever the case may have been, or took a trip down there, it's like, what, we was going to be in the wrong? Because it's almost like a bully. Like you, if I yeah, keep bullying you, you know what I mean. Like you not doing nothing. It's like I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna keep doing it. I'm gonna keep doing it because you're not gonna do nothing. That's so it's just like, like now it's time for that bully kid to come back and, and hold his own. And as the black people, that's what I'm on. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna drop the mic there. If I can just jump in Please. on that tail end of that, because I appreciate everything you said, and we have had those conversations. I tell all the young people I work with when I do social emotional learning with kids after school, I'm a reform bully. So when we talk about bullies, I speak bully. I used to be a bully. So like I know what it's like, and we're not going to do nothing unless we have a come-to-Jesus moment, <laughs> or you got a big brother that kind of beat you or put you in your place, which is what happened with me. Luckily, I got a big brother and didn't have to come in the streets. But like not, you're not going to stop until you, you can beat me. And whoever, whoever can exert their physical dominance and will makes the rules. That's how it's always been throughout history. If you can assert your physical will, you make the rules. And things people only respect is money, blood, and bullets, unfortunately. And to wrap up our talk on this segment of Buffalo What's Next, the question, what does Buffalo need? Again, Sherman Webb Middlebrooks. Investment in young people. 
financial investment, experience or opportunities, and we need to invest in the adults who invest their time, talents, and energy in young people. Talking to teachers, I'm talking daycare providers, after school programs like us, parents providing support, that all of that trickles back down to our babies. And so we gotta support our babies, but we also gotta support the people who are investing our babies. Cause I heard one teacher share at one of these meetings I was at, but like, if you don't feed the teachers, they will start eating the babies. And so I've seen a lot of parents that's not getting their spirits and their hearts and their minds fed and they start turning on and eating their kids and dimming the light in their own babies because they didn't achieve their goals and nobody encouraged them and nobody believed in them. And so they, they perpetuate that against their kids. And when I work with, with parents in this community, when you believe in them and, and show like support for them, they in turn believe in their kids more. They show support for their kids more. So I think we gotta support these kids by also supporting these parents and adults who take time away from their families to support other people's kids. So that's what our city needs, investment in these young people and watch the return that we get on it. I don't know, there's so much stuff that needs to be changed, to be honest. Uh, we need new ideas. We just need like uh, younger officials. Like, I'm not gonna lie, I don't want, not old, like, I don't wanna say old, but like the officials like here, like. Their ideas are kind of like old school and like newer, they're in with the new so they know what needs to be changed and more investments into uh, programs. I believe that we need to change policies and practices, but we can't do that without racial healing first. Mm -hmm. I'm an, in an educational organization uh, as a 4 H educator, and you also can't solve racial injustice without working with white people. We created the problem, we need to be part of the solution. I'm the only white person, okay, Jay, you're white too. Um, I'm the only white person in this group normally, and we, with this event, we did want more white people there, but we need to have the conversations more. I mean, we need to have them in white spaces, we need to have them in other spaces, affinity groups, but I know as a white person, I need to have this conversation more. So I really want to continue working in 4-H to bring young people together and but you can't do that without leadership, strong leadership with people of color, youth of color. We have a few young people here who are clearly leaders, right? And so that's why, that's why I'm here because we need to have um, the leadership from across the community speaking up to educate, share experiences, and eventually, not eventually, I mean right now, we need policies and practices to change too. But I don't think we're gonna be successful without changing hearts and minds through education. What does Buffalo need? We need to get on our bully in terms of a lot of things. I know that's, that's some of the folks in the audience might not understand the colloquial term which you're using, sir. I think you're getting ahead. <laughs> <laughs> nah, we just got to we just got to get on our P's and Q's in terms of like handling business and actually standing on it. Like something that uh, Giselle mentioned in terms of like when money comes in, holding those accountable to money. Um, the policy changes and, and makers. You know, they need to be held accountable in terms of whatever their campaign is. We need to pull that back up. Like, yo, you said boom, boom, boom. Um, and then I also I believe in the um, generation gap in terms of just how the thought process is in terms of allowing um, both groups, if you will, to actually sit at the table and bring ideas rather than having a traditional mindset. Um, something that Sarah mentioned, last point, um, in terms of allowing um, the white people in spaces in terms of, you know, their people, if you will, um, that created the, 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 the harm, you know, being in those spaces. I always echo this every time I, you know, try to come into the youth camp space, but then also any space where there is racial healing in terms of having more of, uh, white participants or audiences. Um, it's great that, you know, uh, as a white person, that you, you, you're you on my side as an African-American. That's great and all, but, like, I need you to go tell that to your youth. I need you to go tell that to your people. Mm -hmm. um, so with that being said, I appreciate you becoming an ally, but if you really with me, I need you to be willing to – I know it's going to sound crazy and absurd, but I need you to go – um, and be on the other side as if you're willing to die for this because they coming after you because you're trying to help us. Mm -hmm. And if you really not want that, then, like, I appreciate it, but I can make my own damn sign. I could I could say the same <laughs> yeah. things that I'm saying, 
if you really not really willing to go there and speak this to your people and really get exiled or whatever the extremes may be um, to really see change and and and, and um, those type of infrastructure. So, with that, I conclude. <laughs> <sighs> what do we need? I'm gonna piggyback on what Jaden said about having, I should say, um, older generations in power. I feel like if these older generations are gonna be stuck in their ways that whatever were whatever was going on with the generation before them and generation their generation, I feel like if you're not gonna open up to my generation, the generations after me, either you have to give up power and see some type of compromise or you just you don't deserve the power you have because mm-hmm. you're stuck in your ways that just because it happened in my generation, this is what's gonna go. And then you're wondering why education is all messed up as it is. So you're wondering why kids are not coming to school and they're dropping out mm-hmm. or they're doing this, you're doing that. And then you're wondering why parents can't support these kids. And it's just like, you're not helping us in any way. You're stuck in your generation where you had this. It was mandatory to do this and mandatory to do that. We can understand it. If it's mandatory to do this and I can't meet the minimum, where will meet the maximum to meet that mandatory? Where, how, am I, how is this going to work? Like, you can't sit here and be like, kids are out here paying, like, $200 for senior do just to graduate for a cap and gown. That's ridiculous. And But you guys over here boasting that Buffalo Public Schools that they have this education system and this education system, and you tell them you guys gave these grants and these grants and these grants, where is that money going to? Because ain't no way I should be, see, people should be seniors in high school more so worrying about making money so they can graduate rather than getting that degree so they can go to college. Rather than trying to focus on their education and get these scholarships, they can actually be something that you want them to be. They shouldn't be out here hustling at a McDonald's just to pay off some senior dudes or something. Now they're in debt to their school, but they got to pay this, they got to pay that. Just to get an education. That's terrible. Ain't no way parents should be out here working three jobs with like five kids and you're talking with some, oh, well, whatever you're doing, you're not working hard enough because your kid's not in school. So then what are you doing as an educator, as a person in power, to help these kids come into this school? What are you doing to help these communities be better? What are you doing to help change these stereotypes? Nothing. So as an older generation, I'm going to say this in my wrap-up. If you cannot help us younger generations, you got to go. That was, in reverse order, Giselle Manuel, Jamian Utsi, Sarah Jablonski, Jaden Phillips, and Sherman Webb Middlebrooks, who we thank for their time thoughtfulness, and honesty during their recent meeting of the 4-H Youth After School Program at the offices of Say Yes on Jefferson Avenue. You're listening to Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. Birds at Play. I'm Bob Hershon, and this is Science Update. Young children learn about the world around them through play. Now, researchers think some birds may do the same thing by playing with objects they later use as tools. University of York cognitive zoologist Megan Lambert and her colleagues conducted an experiment in which Kia parrots and New Caledonian crows could retrieve food from a box with the help of a heavy object or a rigid tool. But light objects or flexible tools wouldn't cut it. The birds performed much better on the task if they'd been allowed to play with similar objects of various weights and rigidities beforehand. They sort of start to learn how objects are actually acting and later how these objects can be used as tools. The researchers write in Royal Society Open Science that this is some of the first evidence of play providing non-human animals with vital information. I'm Bob Hershon for AAAS, the Science Society. This is Buffalo What's Next where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And welcome back to Buffalo What's Next. For the remainder of the program, we're going to be talking with India Walton. India Walton, of course, is the uh, um, Common Council or seeking the Common Council seat in the Maston District, and she's with us this morning. Good morning to you. Good morning, Jay. Thanks for having me. Uh, Thanks for for being with us. You know, I've also got to thank you. I was kind of reflecting on this a little bit. You were one of our first guests when the show went on the air back in June, Um, and also your opponent, Zanetta Everhart, was also one of our first mm-hmm. guests. And I want to thank everybody who, especially in the early days of the program, you know, 
came in and gave up their time. So thanks for that. And, and to that, I was thinking, well, if, if Zanetta was here, I would ask her, how is her kid, Zaire, how are your kids doing? My, my children are doing great. Um, yeah? My youngest is 13. He's oh going to high school next year. Um, you know, I was recently able to purchase a home for a family. My sons live in the downstairs apartment. That makes that brings me so much comfort. <laughs> I bet it does. <laughs> that I can be very close, but not too close. Right. Um, so everyone's well. And so you relocated into the Masson District. You bought your, your home. Mm-hmm. Um, what prompted that? Just uh, the, you found the right place in the right right neighborhood? What? It's a gorgeous home. It's literally what I've always wanted when I imagine myself purchasing a home, historic, you know, good craftsmanship, wood, um, all of the things that I've always dreamed of in a home. And when I found it, it was just a no-brainer. Uh, a little while ago, I had Matt Deering in here uh, who's running in the Ellicott District, and I had him kind of do a mental map for me, draw draw Ellicott, and it got confusing. <laughs> How about Maston? Uh, give us kind of the, the, the rough outline of Maston. Maston is equally as confusing, um, and a, a lot of folks believe they live in one district, um, but actually is that right? live really? in yeah. another. Okay. Um, you, well, it's basically bordered. It begins around Main Street. Some parts of it extend all the way out to Bailey Avenue. Um, I think Glenwood might be the border on one side. It kind of cuts down Jefferson. It does include the Martin Luther King Park area, but not the surrounding neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, an, it's an interestingly drawn district, um, but it, it's, it's quite large. And one of the things you told me just before we went on the air, which stunned me, There is not one public library inside the Maston District. There's not a public library in the Maston District. There is not a a corporate grocer in the Maston District. There are a few um, full-service markets that have been opened up by members of the Bangladeshi community. Um, But, like, as far as a Tops, an Aldi, a Price Right, or there there's not a full service grocer in the district. And it's kind of hard to believe considering I mean it, that's a historic district, correct? Mhm, it is. What did you what have you learned about? I saw I, I think you were being interviewed by Claudine Ewing when you first announced that you're running and you gave a real nice talk about just the, the what of those who came before you in that district. Let's talk mm-hmm. about that just a little bit to share with us that. Well, Maston for a long time has been the seat of black political power, right? That is the mayor's home turf. There is a saying that, you know, the road to the mayor's office goes through Maston. Mm. Um, But it's historic. There are homeowners who take a lot of pride in where they live. Um, But I've been saying Maston deserves more. As great as it already is, it could be better. We do need a public library. Sure. Um, When we think about rates of poverty, when we think about how many folks rent, um, we need to protect our tenants. And we also have to support our homeowners and make sure that as we look at increasing climate change, that folks have their homes retrofitted, that they're well insulated. And, and, you know, we don't want a repeat of what happened in December. Yeah, you just brought up three great issues there, and we can get into each one of them. Let's jump to the, the very end then, like you said, December. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're talking about the Christmas blizzard uh, where 47 people died mm-hmm. uh, at, in the blizzard. What was going on in your district at that time? I I was home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I lost power very early in the storm and thinking about the resources that were available to people that were not in a, as good of a position as I was, right? Like, I can afford to stock up on groceries. Okay. Um, we had water. We, so I closed the f- the doors to the front of my house, and the boys came upstairs, and we pretty much held up in the back portion and were able to he- keep warm with the heat from our stove. However, I could see through the French doors my thermostat. It was 32 degrees in my house. Wow. And had we needed milk or bread or whatever to sustain ourselves, there was 
really nowhere accessible to go. We were fortunate enough, like I said, we lived very close to Kanisha's College. Kanisha's had opened its doors as a warming center, and when I went in there, there were families, children, dogs, um, and people seemed to still have a pretty positive outlook on things, but we were fortunate enough to live in a neighborhood with an anchor institution like Canisius that was willing to open the doors and have backup power so that folks could stay warm and have something to eat and be in community with one another. Wow, that's the first time I've actually heard of that, so that, that that's that's terrific in that regard. But you're talking about resources, though, and you've probably had a chance to think about this then. We know the way it worked at Christmas time. How could it work? How should it work? What what have you what have you looked at that that stands out to you? That's a great question. I was actually just um, a member of a roundtable um, on storm response and talking with Black club leaders about what we could do different. And every neighborhood in Buffalo has a fallout shelter, has a public school, um, and if there is a community center these places should all be fitted with backup generators. And there should also be stockpiles of non-perishables there for access where people can get there in walking distance. I also think that, you know, the deployment of the National Guard to keep order (laughs) um, was an inefficient use where that could have been a means to not only conduct search and recovery, but to bring essentials, right? The suburbs, streets were clear, stores were back open, days before any of that happened in the city. In Maston District, there are still stores that are not reopened after the storm. Um, so to just to be able to use the resources we have in a more efficient way to actually serve people rather than control hmm. um, and, and a cost, um, I think was a, a real point of frustration for me. What about communication? Now, this is something I, I heard from Another person kind of on the outside of all of this, but thought that council members could be and should be almost the lead for their districts when it comes to communicating in scenarios like that. Can you see that being the case? Your primary job as a council person is constituent services, right? Um, and, and the biggest part of that is communication. These people have followings, you know, I think that should and could and as council member will be my primary role is being with the people that I serve right um a lot of times we'll go to the common council for one reason or another and we're told well like that's not our job it's not our responsibility but we all know that the council is the most accessible form of government for most people we know that Tuesdays at two o'clock, if you go to the 13th floor, <laughs> like you're going to find your council member <laughs> right, there, right? Right. Um, so, you know, how do we make our city government more transparent, more accessible, take the council's office outside of the ivory tower of City Hall, embed it in the community where people can actually reach you um, and actively communicate, right? I feel like our council is constantly responding to things, but how do we take a proactive approach? approach and plan before the next crisis or disaster happens. We're with India Walton uh, this morning on Buffalo What's Next uh, for the rest of the program. India, of course, running for the uh, Maston District to Common Council seat. Um, You're going around uh, door to door to get petitions. How's that going? It's going great. Um, The part that I love about running for office most is talking to people, is knocking doors, is meeting people. Folks have been waiting. I think that there was a lot of hope in 2021 for the change that I would have brought into the mayor's office. And I think that people are excited. Um, The top response that I get on doors is, I thought you were taller. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well i guess there's a lot of ways you can take that right <laughs> well, that, that's nice so but what about so you, you're generally getting a good response then in general we're getting we're getting good responses on doors i think that people in buffalo are just tired um we're tired of being the perpetual loser. We're tired of being told there is a renaissance, yet rents are increasing, taxes are increasing, wages are not. Um, you know, there are 
increasingly stories coming out about children being led, poisoned, and out-of-town landlords knowingly putting families in homes that have not been remediated. There's very little enforcement of our code. That gets heavy. Um, And the resilience and hope that remains in spite of all the challenges that we have is something where I feel like I need to work extra hard and make sure that I deliver for the people who are still sticking it out after all these years. You, you touched on the, the big thing, housing. housing. I think what I've heard that there's a 98% occupancy rate right now in Buffalo, and that might even be a little low. Um, obviously, there's a, a real struggle when it comes to housing. It looks like a, a place on Elmwood with, I think, had over 125 mm-hmm. um, apartment dwellers in there is going to be demolished. So right there, I mean, that's a crisis. Masson District Council member, what can a Masson District Council member do? Um, a Masson District Council member like me, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, I mentioned I have lots of big ideas that folks often say are unattainable. One of my professional experiences and expertise is in the creation of permanently affordable housing, the work that we did in the Fruitvale Community Land Trust, right? And I think the criticism of it is you only built two houses. Hmm. And my response to that is, how many houses have you built? Hmm. Um, Housing development is a complicated... Especially affordable housing. Especially affordable housing, right? But it is important enough to try. And I think working with city government, working in city government across departments to make sure that we have a comprehensive land disposition policy that prioritizes nonprofit and affordable housing developers and gets some of the 7,700 vacant lots, most of them are on the east side, get them in the hands of affordable housing developers so that housing can be built And those on vacant them. lots, the, 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 those are just the ones owned by the city, Those are correct? just the ones owned by the city. Um, getting them in the hands of affordable housing developers for the creation of affordable housing is going to be key. I think that we can also um, not only improve, but sufficiently implement the green code um, and also incentivize developers to put inclusionary zoning in their project so that with every unit of housing that goes up, there is affordability baked in. Right now, like, we're just giving away the milk for free. Right. Um, we're, we're giving variances um, and, you know, I don't... Well, and let me, you, you mentioned prior, prioritizing affordable housing developments. It sounds good. Financing for affordable housing is very complicated. The m- margins can be very small for these developers if there are any types of uh, margins that help them out. Can you talk a little bit about that? Or are we going to go too far deep into the weeds here with this type of thing? Is Are there legitimate options that can really finally incentivize affordable housing developers in the city of Buffalo? There are. I mean, we give tax incentives for market rate projects all the time. Um, We can and should be doing the same thing for affordable units. And I think the easiest answer for me when we talk about numbers and margins and making the numbers work is that in my heart, I truly believe that every person deserves a safe, affordable place to live period, no matter how much money you make or don't make. Um, I traveled to Vienna and looked at social housing models. It works. 70% of Viennese people live in some sort of subsidized municipal or supported housing. Um, And it's beautiful. It's high quality. They have access to amenities. They're living in walkable neighborhoods. And we can we can do that here. These Models exist in other places. Um, We've just been fooled into believing that some folks are deserving of a decent place to live and others are not. And I would like to change that entire narrative and along with that, present, implement, and legislate strategies for making sure that we get our people housed. India Walton is our guest on Buffalo What's Next. We're going to take a, a brief break here. We'll come back with more, a lot more to talk about for sure here on Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. Do you absolutely love Masterpiece, Antiques Roadshow, PBS NewsHour, great performances, and other amazing shows on WNED-PBS? But you're not always in front of your TV when they're on. Don't miss them. 
You can stream the channel live wherever you are in Western New York by visiting wned.org slash live or use the WNED PBS app. Through NPR Student Podcast Challenge, we've heard amazing stories on what it's like to be a student today about race and identity, about climate change and video game addiction, history, music, and art. So, middle and high school podcasters, here's your chance. Submit your podcast by April 28th. Visit npr.org slash student podcast challenge 2023 for more information. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And back on Buffalo, what's next with India Walton? And uh, going into the break, you were talking about finding ways to get affordable housing done in the city of Buffalo and working to get this legislation together. At the same time, we've got a uh, common council that it looks like we're going to have pretty much the same crew of people back. You know, I mean, the same. You know, most of the incumbents are going unchallenged or relatively unchallenged. Not all of them, of course. Um, Ellicott is open. Maston is open. Is there, do you sense that there's enough of a political wind or a push or a moment right now where these types of ideas can be pushed, where you're going to be having to get some people who have not necessarily resisted, but most certainly haven't acted upon these issues Mm -hmm. to get on board? I think that one of the most important things that came out of the mayor's race of 2021 is that conversations changed. Um, There are issues in Buffalo that cannot be ignored, and I think that the Common Council while it is supposed to be the branch that is checking the executive level, for many years we've seen it more as a rubber stamp. And the more conversations that I have with people is they want to see something different. Eve Shippens is running in North. Eve is a teacher and a union leader, a union leader um, great candidate in North District. Um, Catherine Franco is running in university. And... My response to the momentum or, you know, people even saying not enough seats are being challenged. Buffalo is 191 years old. Mm. And since its inception, we've subscribed to this two-party system. What we are building is in its infancy. We've been working on this for a solid maybe five years. And the progress that we've seen in such a short amount of time is very encouraging to me, not only because we are running people, but we are also upskilling people to work on campaigns, to serve on boards and commissions. The conversation is changing. People are learning more about the importance of voting in local elections in off-cycle years. So um, besides getting people into seats... What we're doing matters because it is getting average, everyday people engaged in the process. How many people normally vote in a common council election in Maston? (laughs) Normally, um, Mm. 2,000 is is a good number. I was actually looking up um, primary elections um, and one year— a person won by a margin of 16. Oh. 16. So these races come down to the double digits, and when people say that your vote doesn't matter, it definitely does. And I think there is power in proximity for a common council person. If you know that person is going to answer your call, it matters because a lot of times they have the influence to get the wheels turning on whatever issue it is that you need to tackle or fix. So, you know, I'm just encouraging people to get out, um, get out and vote. And just to, to be clear, you're, we're talk, you're running for the Democratic primary here, mm-hmm. but you are also ha- are 
guaranteed being on the working families line? Is that is that do I have that correct? I'm the working families party endorsed candidate, so I will be on the working families line as well. Okay, all right, very good. I want to make sure I get in a couple of other things here before we go because our time goes so fast. Um, our uh, reporter Emily Watkins has done a lot of work on disability issues here, and as a matter of fact, has spent a lot of time uh, working, covering City Hall and trying to, I guess. Uh, Talking about their lack of a of a uh, somebody to uh, uh, handle the ADA issues out of uh, City Hall, she also mentioned that uh, you had an idea when you were running for mayor that you wanted to have an office for people with disabilities. Correct? How I do you did. stand on that now? Um, a lot of what was on the platform for the mayor's race is simply being tailored to the district level. Okay. Um, my values don't change depending on the political winds. Um, I think that it is important. Um, we're still waiting for them to hire a person <laughs> for right. this office of, right, right. of people with disabilities. <laughs> um, but being out and knocking doors. like to, just, if, so, just to be clear, our, it took our reporters a lot of work just to get that thing posted, but another story. Continue. Right. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, canvassing and knocking doors, if anyone's ever, like, done a canvas in Buffalo, every house has stairs. We have a serious issue with ADA compliance mm. across the board, right? We're not only talking about access to city government and services. We're talking about housing. Um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of folks who have mobility challenges who can't find an ADA compliant apartment, home, folks who are aging out of their homes and want to live in a flat where everything is on one floor. We're not building that type of housing to replace what we've lost. Um, so there are lots of parts of my platform and I can hear already in my mind that is not what a common council person does, mm -hmm. but it is what I do. This is the way I'm wired is to think about the solutions to the problems of everyday working class people. And the council can be a conduit to work with the Division of Real Estate, with Bura, with local nonprofit and affordable housing developers, with the mayor's office to make sure that we're rectifying a lot of these issues that have come up and not been addressed. Uh, you, you seem to be touching upon it. Like you said, you're, the, the platform's the same as when you ran for mayor. Mm -hmm. um, we can go down the the history of it again, and it's, it's such a remarkable story. You win the Democratic primary, of course, but then you lose in November to a, a write-in campaign. Among the, among the things that I, I recall during that campaign is I think you're using the word democratic socialist mm -hmm. in describing yourself. Let's vet that out just a little bit. Instead of just putting a label on something, describe what that means and how it, it impacts your platform. I think the most important part is that there is no political party called democratic socialist, right? Um, a democratic socialist is more a set of values and economic principles where I want people to have access to health care, affordable housing. I care about the environment and climate justice. I care about racial justice. I care about economic justice, making sure that people are paid a fair wage for their labor. So when you lead with the issues, when you say you've worked 40 hours, can you afford to pay your rent and buy food and maybe your insulin or whatever else you, you may need? And the answer is no. Mm. That is a lot more resonant than people using the label democratic socialist as if I'm going to be seizing people's <laughs> personal property, <laughs> right? Like they, it was really used as a fear tactic where I would walk up to people and they would say, I like everything you're talking about, but you're a socialist, right? And I'm like, the reason why our streets are paved, the reason why there's indoor plumbing, Right. They called them sewer socialists back in the day because that is how we got municipal infrastructure that kept cities clean. So this time around, we're going to focus on the issues. I don't care what you call me. Right. I prefer India. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I mean, are you hearing that then still? I am not. OK. I'm not. So that is progress. I think it I think it is. I think that people have not seen the material conditions of their lives change and I think that a lot of people wrote in 
Byron Brown because they were afraid. Because I was honest, Jay. I said our city is in fiscal crisis. We're going to need to raise taxes. He told those people to their face that he was not going to raise taxes. And the moment he got back in office, what did he do? He raised taxes, right? I did the research. I had a team of people who said, mm, maybe one or two percent and like you'll be able to like improve city services. And he gave them five. Um, so I, I just hope that this time we are able to get our message out be more clear about what it is that we seek to do for constituents in Maston District and in the city of Buffalo, right? Like we can set the example for how a common council person is supposed to work with community and be in community and build durable, trusting relationships to get things done. We can be a model and put the pressure on other council people to do the same thing. Right. And then when we have those six votes on our common council, we can then push the administration further to adopt more progressive policies that actually prioritize working class and poor people in Buffalo. As you understand it, why isn't that the case right now? Like you said, our, the mayor is a, a member of the Maston district and he's on his fifth term. As you understand it, why why isn't that heading? Why isn't the city already where you want it to be? There's a lack of political will <laughs> when there's no accountability. Um, when we see these stark contrasts and disparities on the east side of Buffalo and you're not being held accountable when you are allowed to stay in office for 20 years and you have not addressed the racial wealth and home ownership gap. What incentive is there for you to do anything different? If you keep doing the same thing and you find success personally, it doesn't impact him. And when folks are asking me how I feel about having a black mayor, I just said, like, the mayor's problems are not my problems. We have different sets of issues, right? He got rich people problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I have poor and working class people problems. And the majority of the people in the district that I seek to serve have India kind of problems, poor people problems, child care problems, lead abatement problems, food access problems. You know, um, I was telling someone the other day, my, my, my mom lives in Alabama and she comes to visit periodically. And after I first um, moved into my house, I said, Mom, you haven't come to see the house yet. And she says, I was over there like no one wants to come to your dusty house. <laughs> and I said, why does my house have to be dusty? And she's like, no, seriously, you need to power wash the outside. And I went outside and I looked at the exterior of my home and there's soot on it because I live very close to the 33 Expressway. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, and I, I tell these stories because these are things that we don't often think about because we're in it. We're in the thick of it and we're living day to day. But if you take a step back and look at a bird's eye view of all of the issues you can't, I can't afford to be a single issue individual. I do have to care about housing. I do have to care about health care. I do have to care about like whether the 33 is covered and made into a tunnel or restored to a beautiful parkway with trees that are going to keep the temperature lower in the summer and reduce the, the carbon emissions in my neighborhood. Um, yeah. So I guess we know where you stand on that issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, and you've seen enough examples across the country mm -hmm. where you feel that this push, this progressive push, can happen in Buffalo? I've seen enough examples from across the world. Um, I think, aside from being mayor, <laughs> losing that election could be one of the greatest learning experiences of my entire life. It allowed me space to be mentored and coached. It allowed me invitations to places that I'd never dreamed that I would be. I've been to Barcelona looking at solidarity and social economies. I've been to Vienna checking out social housing. I have um, been in so many spaces with people who are thinking about policy, who are implementing policy that really benefits not only black folks, but poor and working class white people too, right? Um, so I, I'm feeling more ready now 
than ever, um, not only to lead, but to serve and to be able to uplift and bring the hardworking people of Madison District and, and Buffalo into all the places that I go. Well, that, you almost hit it right on cue, as a matter of fact. Uh, the music started, so that means it's uh, <laughs> the end of the program. Where can people find out more about India Walton these days? Sure. Find me all over social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, also at www.indiawalton.com. Or um, stop by our field office at 571 East Delavan. We're there every day from 2 to 6. Um, and on weekends, we're there from 11 to 6. 571 East Delavan. 571 East Delavan. Very good. India Walton is the candidate for the uh, Common Council seat in the Maston District. She joins us to this morning. Thank you very much for being with us. This uh, show has been produced by Lorenzo Rodriguez. Associate producer is Charles Gilbert. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown. <laughs>